Welcome to Radical Engagements here at Varnblog. And we will be talking about a classic text today, uh, Frederick Engels is on Authority, from uh, 1872, published in 1874 in Italian, um, in response to the Hague c Conference. It's often cited as the definitive a refutation of anarchism from the Marxist perspective. I am covering it uh, today um, because I've never been impressed by this text. I essentially think it's a straw man argument. Um, whether or not one is an anarchist or not, or some kind of liberal, uh, citing this text as a definitive answer to the question of authority is just insufficient. It's barely four pages in the original printing, if you find it in the Mark Singles Reader, uh, the Robert C. Tucker version, you know, from 1972. It's on page 730 to page 733. It is effectively... One, two, three, four, five, six... 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 paragraphs. Um, and I am, t I tend to be a defender of the good Mr. Ingalls against a lot of the slander against him, uh, particularly by the new left. But I've always found that, um, Socialists, particularly Marxist Leninists, to use this text as a definitive argument, it convinces no one but themselves. So let's get into the text. And I'm covering it because you're going to need it to understand another text that I'm going to be spending a long time on because it's a long text about these debates. Um, and so it's important that you have this characterization. It's also very short. It's off-quoted. Um, on the internet because it's so short and because basically since it is a straw man argument it is also a fairly simple argument maybe even a simple tens <laughs> argument which is unfortunate and not generally like Ingalls. Um, I think it's important to note it wasn't actually originally published in German so you know that that may be part of what's going on here it's just a short little plumbing We'll have the real text up so you can read along if you want. Um, I'm also going to link to it, but I'd like to use the free Marxist.org archive version. Work of Ingalls, 1872, on authority. A number of socialists have lately launched a regular crusade against what they call the principle of authority. It suffices to tell them that this or that act is authoritarian for which it is to be condemned. This is a summary mode of procedure is being abused to such an extent that it has become necessary to look at the matter somewhat more closely. So what he's saying here is like, uh, there is, you know, people c complaining about authoritarian methods in, and this is, I believe in the context of the first international. Um, so we have to disaggregate this here. Authority, in the sense of the word used here, means the imposition of, of the will of another upon ours. On the other hand, authority presupposes subordination. Now, since the two words sound bad in their relationship, which represents disagreeable to the subordinated party, the question is to ascertain whether or not there is any way of dispensing with it, whether, given the conditions of present-day society, we could not create another social system in which authority could be given no scope any longer, and would consequently have to disappear. I'd like to say that because that's the goal of a class of society. It's not just um, getting rid of, you know, capitalism. It's also getting rid of the social relations of production that undergird capitalism and undergird uh, exploitation in general. That's Marx and Engels' stated goal themselves. On the examining of the economic, industrial, and agricultural conditions which form the basis of present-day bourgeois society, we find that they tend to more and more replace isolated action by combined action of individuals. 
Modern industry with its big factories and mills where hundreds of workers supervise complicated machines driven by steam have superseded the small workshops of separate producers. Asterisk. This is part of why I'm a decanist theorist, because this is no longer true. And assumptions that leftists made to organize around giant industrial production tend to actually work in the institutions that are left when giant industrial production leaves, such as schools and healthcare apparatuses. See the works of Gabriel Winant for, Winant for this. But don't actually still operate in capitalism at large. Even mass production has been, in many ways, re, um, re-territorialized. That's what Deleuze and Guattari's, you know, prose poetry was essentially about. All right. We actually return to coordinated mass production that looks more and more like the small workshops of separate producers. The carriages and wagons of the highways have been substituted by railway trains, just as small schooners and sailing facundas have been by steamboats. So again, there's the assumption that everything's going to continue to get more and more mass consolidated and that socialists will just be able to seize this. Engels, on this assumption alone, is wrong at this point. It was right when he was writing this, but he's wrong now. If you cite this, as proof of the development of modern society, you are missing a kind of dialectical truth that we actually developed these mass production bases so thoroughly that they no longer need to be centralized and centrally located in this way. And thus, there's been a, a sort of return to prior older forms of alienation. In many ways, the average proletariat today has a consciousness similar to what uh, Marx talked about the peasant in France, in particular, in the end of the Ancien Regime, have. That is very, very much where their immediate interests and access are within a few people. And even though they're dependent on large other forms of people, because you're always dependent on the labor of others in modern society, uh, that is all hidden from you. Anyway, back to this. Even agriculture falls into increasingly under, under the dominion of the machine and steam, which slowly but relentlessly puts in place the small proprietors by big capitalists who, with the aid of higher workers, can cultivate vast stretches of land. They don't even need to hire workers anymore, except in very specific areas, guys. Uh, and because of that, they don't need mass armies of proletarian labor. All right. So we already see here that Ingalls is making an assumption driving forward about the nature of capital that was true in the 19th century, but is not true now because of a dialectical inversion of the way this has developed. Now, I use dialectical here advisedly. Literally, the centralization of production created the conditions which production could be re-decentralized, de-territorialized so to speak, because of the capacity centralized and centralized production. Actually removing and automating major functions. Now, you still need people to make capitalism work. You still need people to produce commodities, but you need less and less of them, and they need to be less and less concentrated. Because the concentration itself is in the machinery of capital. All right. So, we already have an analogy here that isn't going to be helpful if we're basing our assumptions off of authority based off the development of industrial production. Already doesn't flow. Right? Now, might not be a good assumption anyway, but beyond that. Everywhere combined action, the complication of processes dependent on each other displaces independent action by individuals. Yeah, except everywhere it doesn't anymore. Again, Ingalls has an almost Whiggish assumption here that this won't invert on itself, that there isn't a law of diminishing returns or a place where the capacity is so big that it re that there's that it ripples throughout society and re-atomizes. This is what led even to the revisionist comp uh, controversy between Bernstein and Kowski. This is a real problem because the assumption eventually was that the proletariat was the, the industrial proletariat in specific would make up more than 50% of the population. That never happened ever anywhere. 
Now, by the way, the industrial proletariat, strictly speaking, makes up about 15. The proletariat itself is universalized. It's by far our, you know, if you don't agree with the definition of proletariat as anyone who is dependent on the general rage fund. Um, but proletarianization is by far the more common now than it was even in the early 20th century. And even things that we call petite bourgeois or professional managerial class are technically and formally proletarianized in that they are about a wage relation in many cases, with only the elites getting paid non-rage relationally with stock options and other hidden investments into capital itself. So again, the centralization both happened and didn't. One of the ironies of today is there's fewer and fewer major corporations, but there's more and more petty proprietors. Again, this actually goes the opposite trend of what Marxists in the 19th century assumed, and definitely what Engels is assuming here. But people don't question this. They cite this and assume that it must be true because they want to win some stupid internet debate, and they want to actually look at the material conditions at hand. Many of them don't have the capacity to understand the material conditions at hand. Fucking humanities majors. Now, I, as a humanities major, know that you can fix this, but it does involve reading all kinds of technical reports. Supposing a social revolution dethroned the capitalist, who now exercises their authority over production and the circulation of wealth? Supposing to adopt entirely the point of view of the anti-authoritarians, the land and the instruments of labor have become the collective property of the workers who use them. Will authority have disappeared or will have only changed its form? Let us see. Now, this is interesting because this is basically saying, will class disappear or will it only change its form? Which in some ways, Engels is actually undercutting a fundamental Marxist argument. Now, Marxists never promised, and this is clear in the critique of the Goethe program, which I'm spending a lot of time on, to do this all at once. They don't think you can deliver a classless society all at once, but it is the goal to deliver a classless society. If we take this, that this is just a changing of the form of power, then is Engels indicating that it is no longer the goal? One of the things I find very frustrating about Engels, I'm often given to defend him, but he's all over the place on many questions, and this is one of them. Another one you want an example. He's inconsistent about when he thinks that socialists are socialized or nationalized and what the distinction is. All right. Let us take by way of example of the spinning of the cotton spinning mill. Notice all the metaphors of the 19th century, and these are assumed to be eternally true. The cotton must pass through at least six successive operations before it is reduced to the state of the thread. But these operations take place for the most part in different rooms. Furthermore, keeping the machines going requires an engineer to look after the steam engine, mechanics to make current repairs, and other laborers whose business is it is to transfer the products from one room to another, and so forth. All these workers, men, women, and children, are obliged to begin and finish their work at the hours fixed by an authority of the steam. Now, notice here that we have the authority of the steam. The steam doesn't have authority. This is an equivocation. Authority strictly speaking, in most cases, only refers to things which humans lord over humans or at least sentient beings lord over other sentient beings and is granted to them by sentient beings. The authority of the steam is non-sentient. That's a, that's a physical necessity and thus is a different kind of authority if you're going to use the word there. So this is an equivocation fallacy, flat out. So if you think this is going to definitively defeat the anarchists as a Marxist, you are showing you you don't understand basic logic. Oh, but dialectic, no, no, there's nothing about dialectics that actually undoes formal logical fallacies. Sorry, not how it works. All right. who cares nothing for their individual autonomy. And it's true that non-human things don't care anything for individual autonomy. So what? Who gives a shit? No one's asking for that. The workers must, therefore, first come to understand on the hours of work, and these hours, once they are fixed, must be observed by all without any exception. That's not true. Um, therefore, a particular question arises in each room and at each moment concerning the mode of production, the distribution of materials, etc., which must be settled by the decision of the delegate place at the head of each branch of labor, or if possible by majority vote, of the will of the single individual will have always to subordinate itself by the means of which the question are settled in an authoritarian way. 
the automatic machinery of a big factory is even more despotic than the small capitalists who employ workers have ever been, at least in regard to the hours of work one might ride upon the portals of these factories. Uh, La caste oni atomen mia voce che entre. Leave, uh, leave ye enter in all autonomy behind. Yeah, which is why the factories uh, were abandoned, because they're not a great way to organize labor. Once you develop the capacity, which capitalists have, to organize it in a different way, the capitalists themselves do so. Why on earth would one assume that socialists wouldn't develop this in a different way? I don't know. So we have a literal, we have a, we have an argument by equivocation and analogy paired with a literal argument about how, you know, even if you have delegates or by majority vote, you're still going to have to hold to the, to the physical needs of production. Are anarchists really arguing that the, you aren't going to need to respect the physical needs of production? And it's assumed that this has to be this way because all these are just getting larger and larger and more and more necessary, which by the way, you know, a lot of liberals talk about like the cog and the machine dreams of Marxists. This makes it look legitimate. If man, by dint of his knowledge and inventive genius, has subdued the forces of nature, then the then the latter avenges themselves upon him by subjecting him, and so far as he employs them, to a variable despotism independent of all social organization. Warning to abolish authority and large scale industry is tantamount to wanting to abolish industry itself, to destroy the power of looms in order to return to the spinning wheel. Except we know that's false. I'm going to say that again. We know from our experience in 2021 that is not true. You have more autonomy over your time. Now you have, you, well, whether or not it's necessary, there's capitalists are always fighting now to maintain control over you so that they have control over you as a form of labor discipline. But it's not necessary in the in for production most of the time. Most of this stuff can produce itself with minimal intrusion from the vast majority of workers. It's been automated that way. And it's been automated that way actually to reduce costs because labor is not cheap. While it's variable and one of the few things you can exploit, it's not cheap. Let us take another example, the railway. Here, too, the cooperation of an infinite number of individuals is absolutely necessary, and this cooperation must be practiced during the precisely fixed hours so that no accidents may happen. Here, too, the first conditions of the job is dominant that will set, settle all subordinate conditions, whether this will be represented by a single delegate or by a committee charged with the execution of the resolutions of the majority of persona interested. In either case, there is a very pronounced authority. Again, wrong meaning of authority. But uh, Ingalls, this is uh, again an, a, an equivocation which you keep on making. But let's just assume you're correct. Um, yes, uh, there are certain needs and demands of maintaining a railway. Uh, the drive for autonomy, even by capitalists, led to taking the technology of the railway and automating it towards the individual car in ways that are actually not efficient, but we sure as hell did it. All right. In either case, it's a very pronounced authority. Moreover, what would happen to the first train dispatch on authority of the railroad employees had over the honorable passengers were abolished. But the necessity of authority and the imperious authority at that will nor be found more evident than on the board of a ship on the high seas. I get these are all this is this is actually a mixture of argument by example and argument by analogy. And Ingalls actually seems to conflate the two. Anyway. There is in time of danger, the lives all depend on the instantaneous and absolute obedience of all to the will of one, the captain, which, again, also not really true. Um, by the when I submitted arguments like these to the most rigid anti-authoritarians, the only answer they were able to give me was the following. Yes, that's true, but it's not the case in which authority we now confer to our delegates. But of com but of a commission entrusted, these gentlemen think what they have charged the names of things, they have changed the names of things themselves. Uh, so do you. Yeah, are you don't know what an analogy is, Ingalls? 
What a petit bourgeois thinker. This is how profound these thinkers mock the whole of the world. We have thus seen, on one hand, a certain authority, no matter how delegated, on the other hand, certain subordination of things which, independent of socialization, are imposed upon us, together with the material conditions which we produce and make products circulate. I want to add that this logic means that Engels should probably actually abandon the hope of building a classless society at all. He's not going there because it would undermine his entire politics. But that's actually the logic that he's presenting. Luckily for us, it's fallacious logic. We have seen, besides the material conditions of production and circulation, inevitably developed with large-scale industry. No, they don't. And large-scale agriculture, yes, they do. And increasingly tend to enlarge the scope of this authority. Ingalls did not have the dialectical imagination, ironically for someone who took dialectics more literally than even Marx did, to see that a certain a certain level of large scale industry would invert back on itself and create small scale subsidiaries. Ingalls can't imagine that, and is simply wrong. And I cannot emphasize that enough. You do not live in the world Ingalls is arguing for. Yes, there are larger and larger corporations. Yes, they're centralizing all the time. But what serves them and how they are served are more decentralized from fragmented forms that require less and less cooperative things because the cooperation itself has been automated. That's not something Ingalls could have even imagined. But we live in that world. So, even if we ignore all the flaws in the logic, his central conceit is no longer true. Even if it was true in the 19th century, it is not true now. Hence, it is absurd to speak of the principal authority as an absolute evil. I agree with that. It is absurd to speak of the principal authority as an absolute evil, but it's also absurd to speak of natural limitations as if it is the same thing that you mean by authority. And that people uh, making those decisions about natural orientations are just going to do so based off of um, engineering imperatives. Which is, by the way, I think where the Bordegas used Ingalls to justify dropping um, all principles of democracy. And of the principle of autonomy being an absolute good. Authority and autonomy are relative things whose spheres vary in places and phases of development of society. Yes, they do. Absolutely. But you, you have just stated that we're only going to get into more and more authority because of centralized development of a production, Ingalls, and you're just wrong. You can't imagine a dialectical fragmenting. Hmm. And this is cited over and over again as the ultimate authority argument against the anarchists. Anarchist, by the way, he doesn't even mention, even though clearly he's referring to Bakunin and all. This is cited seriously by Marxists. In the corpus of Ingalls' writing, of which I like quite a lot, this is embarrassing. And if you are convinced by this, like whether or not you agree that I thought, you know, that there is forms of legitimate authority in the future, which I mean, I would say there probably are at the minute. Um, but if you're convinced by this particular argument, you're not a very sound thinker. And I'm sorry. But you need to come to terms with that about yourself. If the autonomists confine themselves to saying that social organizations of the future will restrict authority solely on the limits within the conditions of production, render it inevitable, we would understand each other. Yeah, I mean, they, but they kind of are. But you're conflating the two things. But they are blind to all facts that make the necessary and passionately fight the, wor the world. Here's the problem, though, Ingalls. You're also trying to say that all decisions of individuals who are empowered to do so will be in light of their physical productive needs. You're not, but you're not actually proving that that would ever be the case. You're just assuming it by equivocations and analogies. Why do the anti authoritarians confine themselves to crying against political authority, the state? 
All socialists agree that the political state with the political authority will disappear as a result of the coming social revolution. That is, public functions will lose their political character and will be transformed into a central administrative functions over watching over the true interests of the society. Oh, if only that was true. But the anti-authoritarians demand that the political state be abolished at one stroke, even before the social conditions give birth to it have been destroyed. Okay, this is a separate argument. One that I'm more sympathetic to Engels on, but he didn't argue that above at all. Uh, you know who argues it? Marx in the, the Critique of the Goethe Program, although I will also say he doesn't really argue it very thoroughly there because it was a private letter that only becomes important in retrospect. Right. Have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? Ah, see, now we have another conflation. They demand that the first act of social revolution be the abolition of authority. See, here he was talking about natural authority, now he's talking about political authority. Notice that he shifted modalities without acknowledging it. These gentlemen ever seen a revolution? I mean, to be fair to Ingalls, he had. A revolution is socially most authoritarian thing there is. It is where... It is the act whereby one part of the population imposes its will on other parts of the, of the other part by means of rifles, bayonets, and cannons. Authoritarian means if there is such at all. And if the Victoria Party does not want to be fought in vain, it must maintain this rule by means of terror with which arms would inspire the reactionist. Yeah, this, is, this assumption is also interesting. The Second International actually didn't like Rose Pierre. They saw Rose Pierre as a a petite bourgeois deviation in which majority a minority power would have to impose its authority on the majority of the population. That was something the socialists should avoid because it was actually unstable. But you can see Ingalls here actually arguing for something like that. Um, would the Paris Commune have lasted a single day if it had not made use of the authority of armed people against the bourgeoisie? <sighs> should we not, on the contrary, approach it for not having used it freely enough? That they should basically... That that uh, the Paris Commune should have been more bloody, which there also is uh, misleading. The argument of, of whom Engels is arguing again. Therefore, either one of two things. Either the anti-authoritarians don't know what they're talking about. Well, you don't either, Engels. I mean, you could both be completely fucking wrong, in which case they are creating nothing but confusion, or they do know, and in that case, they're betraying the movement of the proletariat. In either case, they serve reaction. Yeah, but so can you. You can all serve reaction. That is a, by the way, those kinds of binary framings are apologetics tricks. If you're fooled by them in religion or in socialist polemic, I'm going to say you're going to be fooled by a lot of stuff. I hope that uh, you understand why I went through this, because this is cited seriously as, um, as one of the better writings by Ingalls. And aside from part of the second to last paragraph, I think most of it is basically fallacious arguing. Whether or not we agree with the anti-authoritarians and the anarchists in the Hague Conference, and I largely kind of don't, it doesn't matter. It's still a bad argument. There's equivocations rife throughout it, and they're hoping you don't notice. It ends in a false binary. It conflates different conditions and says that authority is the same without defining authority as such, except as the imposition of one will upon another. But then it actually uses authority through most of the argument as meaning things without will limiting what you can do. Uh, Steam doesn't have will. Under no definition does steam have will. And then he acts as if the delegates of the revolution don't have will because they're only limited by the power of the steam, and that's why they do what they do. But then he makes the appeal to the necessary will of keeping down other willed forces. So two completely different arguments. And he's linked them directly through an assertion about the nature of the development of capitalism, which is no longer true. Like I said, citing this now to anyone who goes through either dialectical or analytic logic as a serious argument is embarrassing to you. Don't. Have a good day.